Hi, my name is Andy Kirk and welcome to Season 1 of Explore, Explain. This is a podcast and video series all about data visualisation design. In each episode, I have conversations with designers and developers to explore in depth the hidden thinking behind their visualisation projects. I'll be asking them to explain the what, the why and the how of their design process. We have some great guests, some wonderful projects to learn about, so let's jump straight into today's episode. Hi, welcome to this episode of Explore Explain. I'm delighted to welcome John Byrne Murdoch to this episode. John, good afternoon. How are you doing? Can you give people a brief introduction to who you are and what you do? Um, good afternoon. Um, yeah, I'm good. Thanks, Andy. I uh, hope you're well. Um, yeah, I am currently here working from home, as most of the world is uh, at this point in time. Um, I'm a senior data visualization journalist at the Financial Times, where I work on a lot of our data and graphics stories. Um, I say that because, you know, we don't try to make graphics for other content. We make graphics that tell the stories themselves. And so I've obviously been um, involved very much at the front line of our um, visual and data stories on the coronavirus outbreak. That's right. And I think it's worth time stamping this episode recording. This is the Friday, the 27th of March. It's a fast moving topic. It's a fast moving and evolving piece. Um, the piece in question, Coronavirus Tracks, is a project from the Financial Times to to keep a, a daily uh, track of this ever-growing outbreak story. Um, I believe it was first published on the 8th of February, and it's gone through lots of iterations since then. Um, to begin with, John, can we just get a little bit of context in the in the sense of a newsroom? So, as I said, this was first published around the start or the first week of February. Um, what was the moment internally that triggered the need identified to start tracking this subject? Sure. Um, so I think this was this is just one of those stories where in a newsroom from time to time there's a major there's a global event happens and there are conversations going on about is this is this a one off story or is this something that we expect to build and to develop um, and then is it something we expect to build and develop in a way that we will just cover in a series of stories or is it something we think is going to be grow in scale um, and in importance to the extent that we should really have a single page that people can keep going back to to track them track something so elections are obviously an example of something like polling for elections we would do long long long-term evergreen tracking pages Um, in the past we've done this for uh, let me think um, other sort of globally unfolding events like um, the migrant crisis in, in 2015 and that kind of thing. Um, so by the first week of February, it was it, it was felt that, you know, this this was still largely confined to China at that stage, but it was felt that because of how connected the world is right now and, and the fact that there were already reports of some cases in nearby countries, that this was going to become something that would just grow and grow and therefore we should have a, a, a graphics-led, data-led page um, that our readers could come back to to keep up to date with this. And, and that conversation at the FT happens um, in a certain way because we have these sort of bridging roles um, called creative producers. So we have um, a colleague of mine called Adrienne Klasser. Um, uh, she works, she's the creative producer for our World News Desk. And so her role is to coordinate collaborations between the sort of traditional news desk there in the world team and our data and graphics sort of digital first team. So she was involved in discussions with our team and we were all thinking, you know, okay, if, we, if we're now saying that this is a story that is gonna continue growing and unfolding, we want to track, how do we do that as the, as the visuals and data team? So with regards to the topic, um, there's probably people out there curious about Financial Times tracking something about health pandemic. What's the scope of the of the FT in terms of choosing which of these topics it should kind of go with? I mean, does this begin with as here's a story that might have an economic effect, or is it something that you, you feel as a as an organisation you should just be tracking regardless? I think that there's a couple of things to say to that. Um, so one is that yeah, we're we're called the Financial Times, um, but you know we're a we're a newsroom that covers all news we you know we obviously cover business and finance more than the average newsroom but we have a huge politics team we have several environment reporters we have like features sections life and arts um or sports team all of this stuff so 
we would, you know, this is a story that we would be covering whether or not it had major implications for economies. But I think the other obvious thing that we can say by this stage is that this is about as economic uh, as a story gets. And, and this was something that became very apparent for us over that sort of the last few weeks of February and the start of March. Um, it, it was very apparent early on that, that our team's workload was going up substantially because there, this is a story where numbers are everything so obviously obviously we're talking today about numbers of cases and deaths but numbers in terms of the the impact on jobs numbers in terms of the impact on the financial markets um it was it got to the stage very quickly where all parts of the ft were coming to us saying we should be can we can we do a chart on this can we look at that can we look at the other and obviously our team as well as well as the epidemiology we've been looking at the economics of the outbreak and, and using alternative indicators to, to monitor things like lockdowns. So, yeah, this was even if this had this been just, quote unquote, just a major public health crisis, um, I'm sure we'd still be reporting on it. But the fact that it's a, a huge public health crisis that has immediate and massive effects on the global economy um, means that, yeah, it was a total no brainer for us in that sense. Right. Now, whenever we, we start pieces of work often the first thing that we should conceive of is some notional um, curiosity some effectively a research question that our work is attempting to answer I guess for this it's a very wide-reaching topic so there isn't really a, almost a single perspective that this can concentrate on but uh, as we've spoken about the the piece started off um, in February as a as a different piece uh, the contents that it began with are still there now but with regards to the people on your side of the equation, the people you have worked with, the collaborators, we've got several names on the bylines for this piece. How has that evolved? And I'm particularly thinking in terms of the teamwork, um, the, the the contributions from each person. Is it simply that it's four people's work that's published together, or do you actually work together collaboratively as a team? It, it's a great question, and it's it's actually been really fun and interesting to to work on this for that reason because. We've, you know, over the years, we work on different types of stories. We work on some of these big standalone pages where several of us are involved on a daily basis for weeks. And then we work on plenty of things where it's one person writing, one of us writing a story or, or one of us making a graphic. Um, and so it's been really interesting because this has largely been a sort of organic process. You know, you can't do long term project planning with something like this, where, you know, if we could, I'm sure the crisis wouldn't be nearly as bad. For the the world as a whole, let alone newsrooms. Um, so so this has been something that's really evolved as it's gone on. And so taking taking this particular piece, um, yeah, this was initially Steve and Kale, my my two colleagues, um, maintaining the page. So Kale is one of our front end um developers, um, and and also a reporter in, in his own right. So. He the the maps on this page are um, a, a relatively new innovation on the FT's graphics team, which is we call them dynamic images. So this is a this web page is is just a standard page within the FT's CMS. Nothing here is has to be built in in a tool that any of anyone in our newsroom is unfamiliar with. So our solution to 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 using the existing CMS but doing interesting dynamic um, graphics is we have these components where um, Kale has built a, a graphic which sits online and reads a database which is also online and whenever that database is changed or at a frequency of our choosing that graphic will update um, so it doesn't need someone to sort of place a new chart into the page every day so Kale has has worked with Steve to design and build those maps and then Kale sort of maintains the the dynamic images there um, Steve, as well as his his work on the maps, also maintains that table at the bottom of this page containing all the numbers. And then the three of us and and now Keith and, and other colleagues are involved in writing the words that appear on the page. So it's it's sort of organically, it's sort of a bit of a modularized way of doing things. So the trajectory trackers that that we're going to be talking about more today is sort of my main mod module. Um, Steve and Kale then look after the maps. Steve looks after the table, and Keith looks after the China Economic Index that we have in here as well. So we are each sort of the point person for each of those parts, but we're we're doing all of this in concert. So we're at the FT. We use Slack. It's our sort of main office communications um, app, and 
all of us are in, involved in these conversations all the time. So Steve and I are chatting pretty much all day on and off because we're both dealing with the same data and same narratives. Um, Kale again, like I check in with every now and again, and, and Keith the same. And we've you know we've got video chats going on all day. We've got Slack going on. So it's it's a you know the the superficial elements of this are sort of one person projects, but the process that goes on behind this page is completely a collaboration. So, you know, we're constantly alerting each other to new data sets that's coming out. We're constantly asking each other for second opinions on charts, uh, that kind of thing. So, so yeah, it's it's got components, but the overall feel of working on this is that it's very much part of a whole. And obviously we are now in a situation where we are locked down into in our houses, working from home. Would that collaboration approach still operate if you were back in the workplace or do you often work remotely from each other and you still need these collaborative environments to to kind of work together on these sort of projects it's interesting thinking about that because um yeah the the collaboration side of this i'd say has worked remarkably well Mm. the remote collaboration side of this i think that's true of our, our team's coronavirus work and all of our work over the last um couple of weeks that we've been at home in general but especially on this kind of stuff i think we we very much feel that you know we're all across this story um like i say frequent check-ins multiple check-ins with one another throughout the day we have occasional little video chats as as a small team discussing like this particular page for example um and yeah i think if if we were in the office it would be much the same because we were i think it was our last couple of days in the office when i started doing the trajectory tracker and and that still it worked fine you know steve and kale were still monitoring this page they were the point people for this page while we were in the office and i was making additional bits which got plugged in there so i think i think that side of it is exactly the same remotely as it would have been in the office and in terms of a wider group of people who might be involved again as stakeholders um what's the kind of process for check-in sign off approval good to go publish uh, in, in the sort of wider scope of colleagues at FT? Sure. So, yeah, there's there's all sorts of people who have an interest and, and some kind of sort of involvement in this page. So one of the main other, other teams or other people is the FT's audience engagement team. So that's our team who are... It's their their role is to absolutely maximise the reach and performance of any piece of journalism that the FT does. So and that obviously doesn't just happen after the fact. It's not just a case of something's been published. How can we get this out to as many people as possible? It's something is going to be published. How can we plan ahead for that? So that's you know it's the, it's things like the headline on the page and the subheading, both of which are used by Google to to determine whether where our page gets ranked. And also used by our readers, obviously, on social media and on FT.com itself to decide whether or not this this is something they want to read. Um, People might also note that in this story, there's a little box near the top showing like other other stories, uh, other stories from the FT's coronavirus coverage that you should read. Um, And so all of these, all of the thinking around this kind of stuff is is generally stuff that comes from conversations with the audience engagement team. So. This um this particular page is actually now by some margin the most read page ever on the FT's website, wow. um overtaking um the our Brexit poll tracker, um from twenty sixteen. So I'm not saying that you know my involvement in a story is critical to it getting record page views, but it's a it's a uh, you know there's 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 something there <laughs> because this page gets so much traffic um. That is actually really important because it means this is a lot of people's landing page for their their sort of um, relationship with the FT. Because obviously, you know, this this page is being seen by a hell of a lot of our existing subscribers. But for, you know, tens of thousands, maybe, maybe more of people around the world, this is their first experience of FT.com. And so it's therefore very important that this page is, you know, it's edited extremely tightly, but also that we're constantly refreshing those links that we put in in the page to other articles because this is our chance to get someone to read a second article mm. on the FT and so on. Um, so yeah, there's there's a sort of daily interaction with the audience engagement team there around what else we should be promoting on this page and, and where in the article we should do that. Um, and then we've got Adrienne, the, the creative producer on the World Desk, who also coordinates with us. She will ask as you know if the world desk thinks oh should we move such and such a component a a graphic or something up or down the page um should we add a new graphic um 
And of course, the actual written copy on the page goes through our team of sub editors um, who, who, you know, make sure the spelling is tight and and all of, all of that kind of stuff. So. So, yeah, there's there's the, the the usual sort of editing process applies here. And then we have those additional audience engagement inputs. Um, and, you know, and again, because of the profile of this page, there are conversations about this particular page with the, the editor of the FT and various other senior staff, because everyone realises the important role that this page is playing in our coverage at the moment. Um, and therefore, everyone has strong and you know, considered views on how we should be tweaking this page as as the story moves on. Right. Um, and it's been evident by the fact that it's come out from behind the paywall to now be a free to anyone access. It's, you know, it's simply your flagship, your newspaper's flagship um, piece of work right now. So, yeah, that's that's really interesting. I mean, the other stakeholders I think are, are important to mention at this point would be the subject matter experts, um, the epidemiologists out there. Um and it's something I think is quite a hot discussion at the moment within the field of visualisation about the responsibility of not just taking data as an amateur visualiser um, and, and putting stuff out there. These things are very sensitive, delicate subjects that need an expert lens. To what degree have you had to seek out that kind of subject matter reassurance or, or, or expertise to, to give you the confidence, not just to plot what you plot but also to then bring the commentary that you do not only in the chat but also through social media yeah I, I think that's such a critical point and you know at the the podcasts I think we're referring to there who've already discussed this I think it's an absolutely central part of this um, and and yeah I I and the FT as a whole take that extremely seriously so I think people sometimes see charts like this and think they've just sort of been thrown together and and that the annotations are just sort of me thinking out loud but um, to give an idea of some of the stuff behind the scenes there so I have phone I've had phone calls over the last week or so with our correspondents out in Beijing um, I'm speaking to our team of reporters in Tokyo I speak to our team in Germany um, and in Spain and that's all because whenever I'm saying anything alongside these charts or of course in the charts in terms of annotations and titles I need to know that I'm saying something that is true and not just you know what my novice in terms of the subject matter my novice eye has picked up on so I you know I talk to the Spanish correspondent about you know why do we think um, Spain's case numbers and death rates are looking particularly high at this point in time um, I ask the Japanese correspondents why they think Japan has done relatively well so far at containing the virus, given that it's it's not necessarily the same as Hong Kong and Singapore, where they they acted very early and stringently. And I talked to the Chinese correspondent about how much we can trust China's numbers um, and any other things that she's she's picking up on the ground out there. So so just within the FT, um, there's a hell of a lot of conversation all the time about what's going on on the ground, and therefore you know. These each of these annotations, a lot of work goes into to that wording, um, and then similarly in terms of epidemiologists and that kind of thing, I've been it's been one of the sort of surreal experiences about this really taking off on social media is I now have dozens of epidemiologists and and medical doctors messaging me and emailing me every day with thoughts and suggestions on this stuff. So that's um, you know, and this is people who who are doing their own research for very high profile organisations, and they, some of them, you know, just saying they that they enjoy the charts, which is always great to hear. But then that that almost always comes with a have you considered also doing <laughs> X, yeah. and and that's fantastic because you know even there are some cases where I can say I have considered and chose not to for this reason, but there's obviously a hell of a lot of cases where they're opening my eyes to interesting things I hadn't considered. They're highlighting things that I've maybe. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I could be misinterpreting. We're talking about, you know, different different visual treatments. Um, so, yeah, that's been one of the brilliant things about this. There was, was one particularly nice moment where I got an email from an epidemiologist at Johns Hopkins, who I actually had first start, I'd started um, following her work a few years ago when she was doing brilliant visualisations on the Ebola outbreak. So sort of the circle is, circle was complete in that sense. But but yeah, there's I'm both on the the sort of journalistic on the ground reporting side and on the epidemiology and, and medical side of this, there are literally dozens of conversations I'm involved in every day about 
trying to make sure this stuff is all absolutely watertight, not just in terms of the data, but the, the narrative. And obviously, in at the time of recording, there's been this discussion in the UK over recent days about the NHS um, slightly altering the way they're reporting deaths. And, and again, that's all the kind of stuff that I'm on the NHS's mailing list. So I'm hearing these um, these things directly from them. I'm talking to um, to various medical doctors who are involved in actually dealing with these cases. So yeah, the, every every word as well as every sort of dot and line that appears on these charts is something that has come from reporting. It's not just a a label being sort of slapped naively onto the top. Yeah, and I think just as as a side note, I think there's something about the you know the last decade or so when tools have automated um, in wonderful ways the ease of production of you know any chart that we can imagine there's something I feel that is missing when you don't have the struggle of the creation sometimes it can feel that it's just a fast track and it's a shortcut and that journalistic um, essence that you've talked about there you know checking every word picking up the phone the, the old thing that every journalist will always talk about um, is is not seen and witnessed necessarily obviously in the piece we see it is there but readers don't always appreciate the, the huge hidden part of the iceberg that goes into what you arrived at there just one last point about the the, the new world of expertise that you've been open to in terms of um, I mean, we'll, we'll speak later about the sort of social media side of all this but I just wondered all those scientists who are now getting in touch do they coalesce around similar advice or do you find this kind of contradictory and um, conflicting advice coming that gives you even more trouble trying to wade through a path of what's the correct way um i mean generally it has been it's been fairly among the epidemiologists it's been fairly consistent so you know that's a community where everyone understands the the argument for things like log scales and understand and 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 appreciates things like how we're doing the x-axis and and uh, and have you know has relatively solid trust in the data at least and so the discussions there are more about what kind of um in you know trends in the virus we might have coming down the line that i should be aware of and maybe starting to think about highlighting in the charts um or you know additional analyses and work that they're doing in the background and and they're interested in whether that could inform what's going into my to my graphics um so generally consensus there but but yeah there's all sorts of differing opinions elsewhere so uh, you know among data visualization specialists among other quantitative and visual specialists so and and in a way I, you know that's for me is nice because if if this were if if everyone agreed on um things like axes decisions and that kind of thing it would be it would be a bit boring absolutely um and so and also that this is kind of the point none of these things are black and white they're all judgment calls and and one chart will do one thing and another chart that makes different decisions can can do a different job much better so yeah that on the on the particular sort of data visualization elements there there are there are i can assure you that there are a hell of a lot of opinions in my inbox um but on the epidemiology side that's generally been been pretty like there's been a lot of agreement. I think there, there was one thing which someone took issue with, um, which was on, in uh, and uh, as you say, we'll come on to the social media side of this later on, but one of the things I'll sometimes do with the graphics that I tweet out is I'll put a little sort of scrappy annotation layer on the top that I always try to do in bright red, which is my way of trying to signal that this is a sort of more back of the envelope style thing. And so one of those things I did a week or so ago was to show where the UK's um, death numbers might end up sort of a week or two down the line. And and I did that just by drawing a straight line on the chart. And a scientist got in touch with me saying that, you know, that was pretty sloppy. And, and if I was going to do any forward projection on the line, I should, you know, base it on an actual, a proper model. And, and of course, in, in terms of the well, I, basically everything she said was completely correct. Um, but what I my argument was that the my sort of red pen scrappy version was only intended to be a rough approximation. Yeah. And had I been publishing that annotation as an FT annotation, it would have been, we would absolutely, we would have either not done it at all or done it or done a full regression model to, to draw where that line should be. Now, of course, someone might say, well, 
they they're just looking at some charts on Twitter how are they meant to know what's an official FT annotation and what's what's my my rough annotation um so so that was a fair point but again those kind of discussions are great because it means next time I'll not do that or I'll know how yeah. to do it better and, and that kind of thing absolutely um I mean the other aspect of people just to quickly touch on is is audience of course and now clearly <laughs> with record numbers of visitors and readers that audience is every different classification but when you set out initially with this um this piece to begin with are you are you thinking about a different audience to the standard ft audience or are you just thinking well we've got a pretty good sense of who our readership is although it might be a different topic that's out from the standard um, realm of topics that we would normally cover we feel that the way that we're going to talk about and visualize this should still be accessible to that bunch of people that perhaps sophisticated audience that might be classified i would imagine for for ft readerships sure so i think you know back in first week of february we were just thinking you know we're going to do this this piece we're going to do this page and it's going to be we we think about our audiences in the same way that we think about any audience so it's just a uh, mainly ft subscribers and you know some other interested people but i think as that started gaining prominence and picking up more traffic, we did obviously start thinking, OK, this is now becoming a bit of a destination page. And it was doing particularly well with um, Asian readers early on, as you know, when the virus was mainly focused over there. And, and that sort of reader demographic has really chased the virus, as it were. So it's now doing particularly well in, in Europe. Um, and yeah, that, so that does inform the way we do this. So one thing we very much wanted to do from the outset with this page, and especially as it's gained more traction, is to make sure it remains truly global. We don't want this to be a page that um, appeals mainly to UK and US readers, for example. We want readers from all over the world to be able to find something on this page that appeals to them, because, you know, they will see it as more important and want to come back to it. They'll also, they're also more likely to share it to other people in their region of the world. Um, and, and yeah, the nice thing is that our, our analytics do show that this page reaches as a share of its audience, a much higher share of people in um, America and in Europe than is, than is the case with an average FT story. So, so yeah, in terms of regions, we definitely want to keep this as global as possible. And then, as you've, you've referred to this in the past, the, the sort of clamour from readers to get this out from behind the paywall. When we do that, we're obviously now aware that a large percentage of readers of this piece will be people who aren't familiar with the FT. So, um, you know, in terms of making the charts and the text accessible to non-usual subscribers, um, we, I, you know, I don't think the the usual FT journalistic style is necessarily inaccessible um, to, to people like that. So we've not really simplified anything when we brought this from outside the paywall um but you know it does it does just mean we're aware that this is going out to people who aren't necessarily familiar with the site um people from parts of the world who don't usually read the ft people maybe with lower incomes and and perhaps less education and and so the, you know these are all things that are on our minds but no i wouldn't say that's it's other than the the need to keep this global in in scope it's not really changed how we approach the content itself yeah and, and i think there's a couple of points there first of all the idea that it's um it's not a one-off piece it's something that is evolving and also people are keeping coming back to it and i always think it's very important when we think about the the potential complexity of a visualization method it may be on the first instance quite an overwhelming prospect to wrap your head around but if you are seeing this time and time again that experiential process that you go through be makes you more familiar so we're going we're going to end up with a g generation of people who are so familiar with log scales and how to read them now just because <laughs> of that repeated exposure um, and i guess as you said there's also something about the ever changing shift of focus of you know obviously the us is now very much uh, a, a center of the story as much as europe is right now and i would imagine if you look forward in three weeks you know we could be looking at um, parts of Africa, parts of India, unfortunately. So I guess you'll always have to shift your focus to reflect not just where the story is, but also where the audiences are seeking insight about this, this story. Um, with regards to the deliverables, so obviously we are mainly speaking to a piece that's on the FT website, but the the website's not the only place that this is outputted to. And I'm, we've spoken about social media, and we will again. Social media is a big branch of how you promote this um, 
not just this work, but the, the, the FT's work in general. But does this work also figure in the newspaper, the printed version? Yeah, so we've we've not, you know, we've not done a sort of single printed page equivalent of this tracker page. So we, we've not printed one page, which is just all of these charts. But we these charts, you know, because of their um, the sort of breadth of scope in, in what they speak to, they've been used in dozens of stories across the FT's site and a newspaper in the last couple of weeks, because, you know, every time we're writing a story about cases or deaths in a certain country reaching a certain point or about how a certain country has managed to get on top of the spread, um, these charts are always relevant. So the nice thing is, you know, because of the way the way this stuff works at the FT, um, every time these charts are uploaded to the site, anyone anyone who wants to use one of them in their story, in their story can do. And similarly, we all have a shared um, drive on, on Google Drive so that anyone can grab the latest sort of vector graphics um, from, from my latest update and can tweak them. So, for example, today um, we've got people looking at a story on the relationship between testing and numbers of cases. And so Steve was able to um, grab a the, the file out of my my folder and then create a version where he's just focusing on the UK. So just knocking back all the other lines to highlight that one. So so other, you know, the, the newsroom as a whole has access to all the PNGs and then everyone on our team across the UK, um, like the visuals and the data and visuals team in the UK and the US and in our other offices around the world, anyone can dip in and sort of customize one of these charts for a particular story as well. So so yeah, these things are being used across the website and in print and and all over social. And and the, the thing I'd say on that is that might sound to to some people like that must mean a lot of work because you've got to make multiple versions of all these charts. But what I'll what I'd say there is the the tooling that we have across our team makes this a much easier task than one might think. So every time we make a a chart um, using our D3 workflow at the FT. That is that will automatically generate up to seven um, different formats of that graphic. So you'll get the mobile um, desktop and extra large web versions of a graphic. You'll get the social media um, ver optimized version. You get the print graphic, and you get a version made for use on our video channels. So all of those graphics will be built um synchronously so if i move if i add a new line or a new highlight to one chart that will appear on all of those charts so whether we whether we are producing this for web only or for web and print the additional workflow is is the additional sort of resource and time is is relatively small um, and on, on that point about the the mobile size versions as well there's a couple of things to say there one is that um this I think most people will be familiar with um, the the fact that for news websites now, most of our traffic comes from people on mobile phones. But the interesting thing is that even, even while everyone's working from home, um, most of the traffic to this page is still coming from mobile phones. So right. that's, as in literally, you know, more than half of people encountering this page see it on a mobile. So um, like... As, as with any other story on, on the FT, the, the graphics, the charts that everyone is familiar with now in this page are all, all um, embedded in this page in three different sizes. So if you're on a big desktop, you'll get the wide version. If you're on a tablet or a, or a narrow window, you'll get the, mo the desktop version. And if you're on a mobile, you'll get the mobile version. So people on, on my Twitter feed will only have seen one version of each of these charts, but there are actually several for, for different devices. Um, and and the the thing on that is so so yeah generally the tooling we have makes it very easy to to do this to simultaneously generate all of these different sizes and formats. But the interesting th challenge with a case like this is when it comes to annotations. So label positioning obviously is a is you know it's a whole sort of field of research like automatically placing text labels. Um, but that becomes even more of a challenge when you're trying to position labels automatically and neatly across different devices and, and aspect ratios. So that's another case where I've sort of been iterating and, and we might come up, come to this later on in, in the segment, but trying to essentially get this get this down to a, a well-oiled machine such that annotations on mobile and on 
So annotations on something 300 pixels wide and then something 1200 pixels wide can be done with minimal um, fine tuning of each one. But yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll come on to that later. Yeah, I, I think just at, at that point, it's worth mentioning just, you know, the, the, the success of newsrooms like yourselves um, in, the, in the modern era has largely been around this background work that you've put into to to a certain degree to automating the me the mechanical production of these things um but doing that also in the sense of imbuing into those processes the the style guidelines and the um the restrictions around as you said if you're doing a chart for a mobile this is perhaps the boundary of the minimum font size you can get away with using for that so i i often think that people see style guidelines sometimes as restrictions and they can be in different contexts but there are also things that can be usually built into these processes to take away the burden of you sat there thinking every day, what's the right font size to use for this? You can just get on with being the journalist that you are. So I think that's a, a key point there. Um, just going back to the, the, the production of different deliverables then, um, there seems to be an, an interesting dynamic with regards to this pro project in general around time scales. Um, because I guess normally you'd have time scales for a print um, production to, to hit, whether that's 6 p.m. or 9 p.m., whatever it may be. Um, but you've also got the demands of the data coming to you and a judgment to make about when to go with the latest version. And all these updates around the world are coming at different points in time. Just on a sort of day-to-day -day basis, maybe perhaps over the last few days, what have been the sort of time constraints that you've faced or even had to impose yourself just to get things done and to focus on other things as well yeah i mean this has been it's an ongoing um sort of tussle really trying to work out how best to do this because the the particular um should we say sort of downside of of this the way this works at the moment is that most of the the countries um that we're that we're really focusing on here in terms of where the epicenter of the virus is are in um, Europe and slightly to the east of us in the UK. So we're, we're typically getting the latest um, data points from countries like France, Spain and Italy in, or well, well France in particular in the evening, um, UK time. So my, my sort of peak working hours at the moment in terms of intensity sort of go from about 6 p.m. until the charts go out. So I've noticed you've been that, eating at some strange times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, as, as some people have said, I've, I've gone for the sort of Spanish approach to meal right, time. So yeah. I'm selling it as being a sort of cultural enhancement. But <laughs> um, but yeah, so so the French numbers and until recently, the British numbers were coming out uh, around sort of 5, 6 p.m. So that was the point at which the production process could really start. Um, the UK has actually brought its timing forward. So if if the French do similar, that might that might change things completely um but but you know it's it's not just based on when the data drops either this is also based on when audiences are going to be peaking so pub, so putting stuff up putting up an update in the the uk evening means you obviously capture all of us as well whereas um there was one day when i did a uk morning update and that you know got plenty of um traction from europe but much the much less well overall because of the lack of the us so it's driven partly by when the data comes out and then partly by when when different audiences are online um but yeah so in terms of the workflow of course the yeah the challenge is this is only one this page and my charts within this page are only one small part of what i and what our team are working on at the moment so we've also got another tracker page looking at all these alternative indicators of how different countries are being affected in terms of their economy. Um, we've also got, there, there are sort of two or three other completely distinct stories that I'm working on at any given time as well. So at the moment, it's sort of a case of from, from our morning meeting through till about 6 p.m., I'm working on everything else. Um, and, and that will sometimes include making the incremental updates to how these trajectory trackers are being generated. And then from 6 p.m., it's a case of, now let's get tonight's charts out. Um, so yeah, it's a weird sort of two phase day where I do my sort of day job and then I do the specific coronavirus trajectory tracker bit of my day job at the end of it. Um, so yeah, still trying to still trying to optimize for meal times and that kind of thing. But but that's that's the gist, yeah. And I guess working from home, um, in some respects, doesn't help with that because then you just the temptation is that the whole day is is working from home. Um, 
moving on to just get a little bit into the the weeds of the data so i mean there's so many different aspects alone about this topic with regards to data to begin with getting the data um multiple countries multiple origins as we'll speak about in a short while you've got countries and you've got sub national regions that you're now looking at that seems to me from the outside to be a huge task of foraging not just to get values but also to substantiate the the robustness of those values can you just speak briefly to the the places that you are getting data from and and i mean you've spoken already about having to speak to you know experts out there different um colleagues around the world to again to kind of confirm stories and and, and ideas I guess that's a key part of this data assurance process. Yeah, absolutely. And, and again, this is something where I think people who just see a chart, they think they assume that the, most of the work goes into the chart. But when I talk about that process that starts at about 6 p.m. every day, that's probably yeah the bulk of the time between 6 p.m. and, and the update is is on the data side. Um, and, I'm you know, that's I'm, I'm always trying to refine and streamline that process as well as the visual process. So. The starting point for this was the Johns Hopkins um, University data, which I think a lot of people will be aware of. So that's they they've been publishing daily cumulative um, case and death numbers for countries and and some subnational regions all around the world. And they've are been they seen as the, the the main custodians of this in some respects? I think they certainly yeah I, I think they're the source that most people are familiar with, and certainly for the first couple of first month or so they were very much just considered as the place to go. So before I got involved in this page at all, before we'd conceived of the trackers and when Stephen Cale were running it, the Johns Hopkins data was just seen as the gold standard source that we used. Um, but then there've been a couple of things over time that has changed that. So one is that, um, and you know, this is absolutely not a criticism of the, the Johns Hopkins team because they do amazing work and, and this data wouldn't exist if it wasn't for them. But there was a period when the country names were being changed almost every night. So we'd go from um, sort of Iran to I Iran, comma, Islamic Republic of, or Korea, <laughs> right. brackets, South to um, Republic of South Korea. So there were little headaches like that. And then um, there was a period when they changed from um, reporting the US data at county level to state level. And I think for a while they did both. And so there was, for a brief time, some of us, myself included, were accidentally double counting data in the US. So there were lots of little bits like that which needed ironing out. Um, there then, there's then the case that for us as a newsroom, the timeliness of this data is really important. So another, another brilliant data source that I think a lot of people should be making more use of is from the European Centres for Disease uh, Control, which they, they have a um, spreadsheet that they put out at exactly the same time every day. It's around noon um, UK time. And that again has daily case and death numbers for every country in the world going back right to the 1st of January, actually. So an extra, a very early starting time series. Um, and that's a great resource. But the, the one drawback for us at the FT, we'd love to use that. But we will publish several stories a day which are based on a new number that has just come out, like within the last hour or so. Um, and that would be a Spain correspondent writing about Spain or or that kind of thing. Um, and that means f in order to have our numbers in, in this page, in these graphics, in this table lined up with that and not to have our own reporting sort of contradicting what we've got in this page, we need the numbers in this page to be very up to date as well. So that's why we're now essentially collating multiple sources. So we still use the Johns Hopkins data as a sort of initial grab we then use some of the european center for disease control data to fill in any gaps earlier that that miss off the beginning of the johns hopkins time series there's then the site world ometers which i think some people might be familiar with which is also sort of crowdsourcing but but always linking back to their sources um on on data which which can lead to getting things faster getting some of the more the more recent updates I, as I say, I'm then in touch with various correspondents around the world who will give me, in some cases, embargoed, like for a brief period of time, mm. brief embargoed reports on numbers. I'm on the NHS mailing list, so I get their daily updates for for deaths in the UK. Um, and then in any, there are all sorts of cases where you, you talked about the subnational data. This has been, 
I think there, there was a point when I regretted uh, doing a sub-national chart because the data collection process there is much more involved because none of these big international bodies are tracking that. So this is where the Twitter has sort of come to the rescue and I've been inundated with links and tips from people in France and people in Switzerland and people in Germany uh, linking me to the best sources for data, sub-national data in their countries. So I'm now pulling in data from all sorts of... Um, researchers github repos and scraping some websites and i people have pointed me to the korean language um pages of various public health sites for me to get the figures for daegu and then similar things for wuhan so that one is at the moment much more of a scattered approach um but yeah i guess the overarching point being that yeah a big task every day is just pulling in the latest data and trying to double check any number especially where anything looks suspect um and that all has to go on before we can even get started working on the charts uh, have you faced an occasion yet where you've had a, a number and you've been kind of close to going with it and then you've had a need to pull it off because you've not quite successfully verified it as a as a true count or would you still go ahead and include it but with a huge asterisk or caveat to that number um no there there have been cases where the 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 main way that the main area where this has come up is that with this international data um it's difficult to be able to assign one number to one day and for that to be the case across the world so when i check the data at say 6 p.m uk time i'm getting generally end of day end of 24 hour period totals for most of the world from britain going east but going west as you go to the us or to brazil and that kind of thing those are either the previous day's figures or their sort of partial day totals um and a bit like the nhs itself has done recently in the uk i've i've now i'm now sort of settling on a on an approach which is i pull the data down at the end of the european day and so the us numbers that i publish each day are the us numbers at the end of the european day and and as long as i'm pulling that roughly every 24 hours i'm it's not that you know i wouldn't sit there and say all of these U new us cases were cases that happened on this um particular date but i can say the the change that you're seeing over the last 24 hours for the us reflects what the data has done over the last 24 hours so it's still it's not an exact science in that sense but but in terms of the day-to-day -day change i'm now fairly happy with how we're recording that and it was kind of interesting to see the um in in due course across the last few weeks there's there's, there's been a shift hasn't there from perhaps looking at case counts or confirmed cases which has been the sort of recent correction of the language i guess um towards deaths has been the perhaps the most reliable number to track something what was the moment when that became a, a realization that that needed to happen as a, a shift in focus I think it was there were two things going on there. Part of it was the you know the knowledge that the the testing rates did and were having an impact on um, on case counts. That's it's been you know widely commented on right since the start of this that countries aren't going to show many cases if they're not doing many tests. I think like people started talking about about that in Iran initially, and then it's obviously extended from there. There was some suggestion early on that that's why Japan's count was relatively low, but. But the data, the evidence on that has continued to to shift around, and I'm not sure people necessarily believe that's the case anymore. Um, but yeah, it was just felt that you know it's 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 like the issue we we run into with crime statistics all the time. Does a rise in a report in re records of a crime taking place mean it's it's happening more, or people are just getting better at reporting it? Um, right. So so you know it was felt that that was a weakness with the cases data um everyone it, it's it's pretty common knowledge that the number of actual people with the infection in any given country is is an order of magnitude or so higher than the number of confirmed positive tests and and you know we know for a fact that for example britain is testing only or at least predominantly people with more serious symptoms um, other countries such as Germany are testing much, much more people, including people who have no symptoms at all. Um, so for that reason, it was felt that adding a deaths chart would would circumvent some of those issues. Um, of course, at the start, there weren't actually many countries that had 
double digit deaths and so it wouldn't really have made sense to include that but as soon as there were unfortunately enough countries with with high death tolls it became possible to do that and and the only thing i'd add there is that it's still the, the death counts aren't exactly completely watertight either partly because um so to, to take some examples so in france for example the death numbers that get reported are people who died in a hospital but if people die in for example a nursing home from coronavirus they're not included in the the published figures there um there's all sorts of chatter about you know whether some countries are reporting deaths only for cases where it was determined to be the primary cause of death and and maybe excluding it where it was only one of many factors and also um the fact that in in several countries unless someone has been tested for coronavirus before death they their death will not be marked as coronavirus related even if it perhaps was and we, and we just don't know so death numbers are imperfect as well but i think as well as being just more sort of emotionally powerful and salient they are probably a better reflection on the actual case on the, the actual situation on the ground than the case numbers which are more reliant on testing regimes right yeah and yeah i mean i've read some articles today about the the inconsistencies in recording death which i guess to a, a lay person sounds quite unimaginable that that could exist but those situations you've spoken to you know do explain how sometimes we have to take these with a pinch of salt just i mean we'll, we'll come on to in a, in a very short while the the range of values the challenge of the shape of data that we, we we are working with it's an exponential outbreak so we've got small through to enormous uh, where once we had only one enormous we've now got several so the the challenges of handling the outlier of china are no longer the same that they were two weeks ago um but I just want to just briefly talk about the responsibility you feel about what we are talking about here, about deaths, about cases. Um, I mean, it must weigh quite heavy on your shoulders when you're dealing with these numbers, because I guess you have to take a certain detachment from the subject to get through the mechanics of publishing this, and perhaps sometimes not allow yourself to veer into the sense of, that is such a huge number. That is such a sad story. Yeah, it's it's a it's a weird one to be to be working on because you know numbers come out and we're we're looking at hundreds of people having died in a twenty four hour period and that's, um you know that's a, a huge tragedy affecting you know hundreds of families um and and in some cases you know whole communities, um and the the environment in which I'm working on this story is one of it's it's deadlines and, and getting stuff out there. So I'm seeing these numbers in a spreadsheet and I'm thinking, um, I need to get this done. And of course, what I'm seeing is the result of hundreds of deaths. Um so yeah, it is it's a it's a pretty surreal thing to be involved in. And and similarly, you know, when I'm when I'm writing the the words around the story or the chart titles or or the tweets, again it's about getting across this urgency and importance of the data but doing so in a way you know that is not it that doesn't just turn this into a scoreboard um and that's why i think i I'm, I'm always trying to keep the narrative to be one of governments and people and countries needing to act in order to prevent themselves ending up where other countries are rather than you know just saying x country has overtaken y and that kind of thing because mm. it's it's just a yeah it's, it's a very odd odd thing to be reporting on see just seeing these numbers in spreadsheets but obviously knowing what they represent and knowing what i'm hoping that these charts can help other countries prevent um so yeah i think it's just about like you say being cognizant the whole time of what this data means um in reality and and to keep emphasizing the the need for action rather than um just the the uptick in numbers and that kind of thing yeah and i guess just because you can't at this stage give um, a face to the human story of the individuals, I guess the human story is that if you don't take actions, others will be coming into this into this chart, and that's and that's the kind of scary thing, I guess. Um, just and I suppose the, the similar point there to make, and I, something I've kind of tweeted out a few times recently is when we as readers come to this chart at the end of an evening and we're looking for the shape th there's a temptation to start to talk about good shapes and bad shapes and good news and bad news 
Um, and it's it's very easy to slip into that mindset, and it's very easy to say, oh yeah, there's only been this number of deaths. That that's great. It means there's th things are taking effect. It could still be there's hundreds of deaths, and I think there's a responsibility in all of us, not just you as the maker, but all of us as consumers, to to read this with responsibility, not just to to produce it with responsibility. Um, so just just moving on to what we see in the actual piece of work itself. I'm going to focus on the pieces that you've contributed, John, rather than the whole piece, because it does cover quite a lot of different areas from um, from Steve Cale and, and Keith's contributions. But if we think about the, the specific angles of analysis that you've um, you could been working on, we've got the cumulative tum uh, totals for the number of deaths um, since the 10th death occurred in different countries. We've got the um, similar story, but at the sub-regional level. We've got the similar story, but for those that are still perhaps lower down the curve, those that have only maybe had a, a few number of deaths. And then we've got the same kind of story for for cases, uh, confirmed cases. Um, I think one of the key things that we see here is, is it's not a map. There are other maps available in the project itself, but the story in this case is not so much about the where in a geographical sense, but the where in a who sense, so are the countries involved. Um, the cumulative line chart that we see as the flagship um, p piece of work, the centerpiece, yeah. is that something that you immediately landed on as the way forward? Have you seen other works that you were influenced by? Did you have any other ideas? Or was it always this as the try and test and method? Um, I'd say it was always this, but that was absolutely based on other things that I, that I think I'd seen. So uh, there are three three examples to flag up there. So. Um, I think the first chart that I saw, because, you know, there were start of early, early March, I think, you know, when things got to Italy and Italy started looking bad, that was when I think we really saw some of these charts starting to do the rounds. And one of the ones I was influenced by initially was by um, someone called Mark Handley, who's a, a professor at UCL. And and he produced a chart which which was looking at these, it was still these cumulative lines. Um and that was one that had a log log scale for the y axis and to, and it was looking at number of cases and then he was showing it with the x axis was the number of days that each country was behind italy which i think was an interesting way um of showing it now i think it was actually that chart that i'd seen but also one of our other correspondents or reporters had seen and, and so a discussion in the newsroom started about should the ft have a chart something along these lines um and I've then seen elsewhere, I think it may have been um, some work by um, John Minton, who is um, a, a public health worker at, at the NHS in Scotland. And, and he'd done a similar chart, um, but he was looking at the, the x-axis unit as, as the number of days since 100 confirmed cases. So between uh, John's work and Mark's work, and, and I'm sure various other bits and pieces as well, I'd, I, I'd, I'd become familiar with this idea of, of doing a chart which is looking at cumulative case trajectories um, and using, using the log y axis and, and that number of days since 100 cases on the X. And, and I know that Matt Cowgill over in Australia did something very similar around that time too. So I think there was a lot of just convergent evolution in, in how people were thinking about this and my my theory as to why that is the case is you know because I, as I said I definitely did take inspiration from other people there but I have my own sort of very sort of considered views for why these various decisions were made so the the log axis I'm sure we'll get onto um, shortly and then in terms of the number of days since 100 cases or number of days since 10 deaths on the on the x I think the, there's a few things I'm I'm trying to sort of get across with that. So one is that if you start these charts at well, I guess starting from the beginning. So if we do if we just did this as a date axis, it'd be very hard to compare any one line to another line because they all start at different points. So that was something we never really considered. Um, if you if you do them as Mark Handley did as a days behind Italy, I think that's that's a really interesting idea and and his his stuff was very powerful. But I think it's there's there's a bit of a level of abstraction there where I think it maybe becomes a bit less easy to to know exactly what you're looking at. Whereas for me, the number of days since 100 cases or 10 deaths was a bit of a compromise. So 
with 100 cases or 10 deaths, you can be confident that an outbreak has now reached a certain sort of critical point. So at just at one case or one death, you know, that could be a bit like we had in Washington State in the US. There was one initial very localised outbreak. Um, but the the major outbreak that we're now seeing sweeping across the US was several weeks after that because of how that first one was tackled. So what I wanted to do with both cases and deaths was was start the chart at a point where the outbreak can sort of be considered to be at the same stage in terms of its spread in each country. So so all of these decisions really were about getting these charts to to line up with one another so you can then really start comparing the the curve which is what the is the the central point of these charts yeah and and so let, let's speak to that then the curve and the 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 choice of the y-axis um log scale um which is something that that you know for, for most of us if we've ever encountered a need to use this there's a certain trepidation in how the audience may um perceive the resulting plots or sizes or or shapes and i think and you can speak to this in a second, John, but I think one of the things I think you've done so well in this piece is always accompany the release of the charts with that little bit of advice or coaching to say, look, don't read so much or attempt to read so much the exact position of the individual daily dots, but just see the shape, see the shape of a country compared to other countries that have perhaps already had a story developing such as China, such as Iran, such as it Italy, and, and compare those shapes, and compare those shapes with the annotated assistance of the reference lines, rather than try and work out how quickly something's growing or, or whatever. So I, I think that's been, you know, such a, a, from the outside, if we take a dispassionate view about the subject, I think it's been wonderful to see people embrace the idea of what's a good shape or a bad shape. But Again, can you just speak to how quickly you landed on the log scale? Was it always going to be that? Um, at any point, did you think that a linear scale might be needed to get across the sheer magnitude of these numbers? Sure, yeah. So um, the the very starting point for this chart actually was an email from a colleague of mine, one of our news reporters, who was just asking, this was on the 10th of March, so the day before I put the first chart out, and she was just asking if we had any data on day by day rises in in cases in Italy. So this was when Italy was starting to look a bit scary. Um, and my initial response to it, I, I made a few rough charts in R and and I sent over three, but one of them, uh, only one of them was a log scale, the other two were linear. Um, and I mean, in my mind, I, I always wanted to use a log scale for this and the, and the top of the charts that I sent her was on a log scale. But um, yeah, the main reason, you know, there's all sorts of things to go into here, but I think, one of the issues, and this is one that I've not brought up as much in my other conversations about this elsewhere, is that with with a linear scale, when you're looking at exponential data, the the curve, the changing curve of a line sort of takes up a lot of um, visual communication space, as it were, bandwidth, without really telling you anything like special. So if you know, if we know that the the spread of the virus is going to be exponential in every country then that curvature of the line as they all as they all go from flat to steep um that's taking that that pattern takes up a lot of a lot of the visual bandwidth in your chart even though it's not really telling you anything because all countries see that same thing so the idea with going to a log scale is that you can focus on what actually is interesting that's happening in any, in any given country which is it's how it differs from being a straight line essentially you know if it's getting steeper then things are really getting bad and it's sort of going super exponential as it were if it's getting flatter it means it's getting off that exponential trajectory and and deaths or cases are maybe starting to to come down um of course there's other other things that i mentioned as well so the the thing when you're dealing with a virus viruses spread exponentially and log scales are are quite literally made for that so whether whether a virus is is um, doubling in terms of the number of cases from one hundred to two hundred or from ten thousand to twenty thousand, that will you know all of the things being equal, that will take the same amount of time and it represents the same problem, the same sort of degree of spread, and of course with a linear chart you give far much more attention um, to the doubling from ten thousand to twenty thousand than you do from one hundred to two hundred, even though they essentially they don't represent anything different happening. Um, and as a, 
as a as a as a country's healthcare system, doubling from one hundred to two hundred is just as much of a problem as doubling from ten thousand to twenty thousand. It's just that the first is just an indication that the second is on its way. Um, so again, I I just wanted the the steepness of the lines to represent um, a you know just just the inevitability of of the of the spread of the virus so that you got you got the idea that we're here Italy is there I'm seeing Italy on the news every day and how terrible it is there and and I can now in my head see that we're on that same path you know as as a way of cons- get, getting people to be concerned by this but not just wildly panicked which I think could result from from sharing exponential lines on a linear scale yeah that's really interesting the idea that you might use this as a as a prop for people to process other inputs of news and 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 awareness of stories. So you're absolutely right. You see Italy spoken about a lot in the UK news at the moment. Right. So how are we compared to them? Um, China may have dropped off the radar in terms of current news, but nevertheless, you see Iran, you know, almost mapping it to the to the exact point. And so yeah, you're absolutely right. It's that comparison that takes place. T- two points I just want to uh, sort of cover then is the inclusion criteria and how that's how that's evolved over time and um, a question of at what point is there too much are you asking too much of a given chart um, currently what's the kind of th- the criteria for who and which countries are included on this main chart versus existing the supplementary small multiples the headline um, death of trajectories chart was getting a bit busy um, and so so yeah the the number of countries involved, um, highlighted, labelled in these charts has has evolved over time. So so a couple of days ago, um, I'm just going to count. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. About 25 countries labelled, 25 lines labelled on this one chart, as well as annotations saying when those countries locked down, as well as the the diagonal lines with their little labels talking about different doubling rates. And, and it, you know, it was just fairly clear now that this was getting a bit noisy and it was harder to pick out the really important points that I actually wanted to make. Um, so for the next night's chart, I paired that right back. And so we've now got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, like about 12 countries highlighted on there rather than down from about 25. And I think, you know, as well as being clip. Well, the key thing is the chart is clearer, but the the usable information conveyed hasn't really dropped at all, and if anything, might have increased. So, the way in my decision making has gone for that is the the things we want everyone to be able to see on this chart are number one, we want to we want to show countries like China because that's the that was sort of ground zero. That's everyone's reference point for for where this all began and for where it was reported for weeks that this was this was so terrible. Um, that focus is obviously moved on to Italy. So Italy remains, Italy, I think, is most most people's experience right now, most people's idea of the, the virus really getting out of control and really getting pretty bad. They, they point to Italy. Um, Spain, unfortunately, looks like it's heading to a similar place as Italy is. Um, and, and the US curve has been ramping up as well. So I, one of the key things to get in is these, these sort of um, uh, archetypal countries, the ideas that, that everyone will be able to picture in terms of countries being very badly affected by coronavirus. Um, next, you've got the countries like Korea and Japan who've done much better at getting the virus under control. So it, it's critical that those are ever present on the charts and labelled and, and annotated a bit to show how and why they've fared slightly better. Um, then you've got countries like the UK and the US, which are slightly earlier in their trajectories so far. But in terms of reader interest, obviously, it's for for the FT's audience and for my, for my audience, these are countries that if these were not on the charts, a hell of a lot of people would be saying, what about me? Um, and, and to be clear, I do still get dozens of emails every day from people all, all around the world asking, what what about my country? What about my town? That kind of thing. Um, so so you've got the, you know, the worst affected countries which are, are the, the sole point of this chart is to say here's how bad things could get here's, here's which other um, countries we could end up like if we don't act then you've got the countries that have succeeded then you've got sort of editorially or audience significant countries and then I, I added three or four others which are other sort of notable countries so um, I've got India for example on the cases chart because you know 1.3 billion people live there I think that's a hell of a lot of people who would be 
feel you know a bit miffed not to see their their country represented and then canada similarly large or significant country brazil um places like that so it's 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 about fulfilling those sort of three needs like the story need the audience need and the sort of representation um need and and the other thing that we we might get onto as well is how the the small multiple charts that i've also added in the last few days that's are right, another yeah. way of doing that yeah yeah, and so on, on that note, it's it's almost uh, for want of a better term, it's almost like a lobby area for these countries to to be visible to reside in until the point at which they do not become a story, or I guess there'll be a jumping point from which they go from there to to become um, profiled in the main piece. Uh, and I, I guess you'll you'll have to sort of take that on a day by day basis. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, exactly that. So you know, the nice thing for from a workflow perspective is that that's that's made things a lot easier because i can now that i've got fewer annotation labels to to move around on the um on the main charts because the you know we've, we've cut down the number of countries we're, we're showing on those um and the the small multiples as, as i say anyone in in any country around the world that's had significantly more than 10 deaths or 100 cases can now see how their country's faring on those so i'm I'm able to pare back the the sort of headline charts to be clearer without leaving anyone, you know, um, leaving any countries completely, uh, completely missing. Um, and, and, and yeah, with the, with the small multiples and with that decision in terms of who to include, it's, it's fairly mathematical at the moment. So for the, for the death charts, any country needs to have had at least four days of double digit, death toll so that you can get a sort of line appearing on there and for the cases one it's four days of more than 100 cases um and in terms of choosing to to include more countries in those headline charts yeah that's going to be a a qualitative decision probably more than a quantitative one it will be you know when the story starts to be for example if the story moves on to turkey or to portugal then maybe they get highlighted in the top chart and something like Sweden or Switzerland drops out. But again, it would only drop out to the extent that it would drop onto a chart immediately below that. So no no country is sort of going to disappear from display. It will just be that that question of which ones go in the, the top headline chart and which one go in the, in the sort of explore at your leisure, find your country right. um, graphic. Um, just a couple more points about annotations. I think it's... Um... It's really nice to see the labels on the y-axis on both the right and the left side. I think we often just abandon the right-hand side, even though most lines are moving towards that direction. Um, but also the reference lines. Uh, this is something that's been kind of added over the course of the of the few weeks, and not just added, but I think I'm right in saying that you've changed the language of what those lines mean. Can you sort of speak to how that um, reading assistance has been sort of has evolved over the last few weeks or few days? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so yeah, in terms of the in terms of the y-axis, yeah, I it's it's just one of those things where the FT style is generally to um, put put our line chart axes on the right because that's where the the latest point tends to be. Um, and then because in this case we've got some countries whose lines are still early on and some that are late, it, it feels like it makes sense to do that on both. Um, and then, yeah, the, the diagonal rate. So this was another thing I, I borrowed from Mark Handley at the outset, which was the idea that there was a fairly consistent 33% daily increase in numbers of cases, regardless of what country one was looking at. So I had that 33% diagonal line there for the first couple of weeks, um, or first 10 days or so that this chart was going. Um, but there were there were a couple of reasons I decided to change that in the end. Um, one is... One is that you know for for deaths at least there is there is more of a a different range of trajectories. It's not necessarily that not not necessarily everything on that thirty three percent line. And and the other is just that you know there I think um, they provide a better set of reference points. So I think it was Lisa Rost who, who I saw doing this first. She and I had she and I had chatted about this chart a couple of weeks ago um, for ahead of her her post about the coronavirus charts on Data Wrapper. Um, and I know she introduced the lines and then Josh Katz over the New York Times um, brought those into, into his and their versions um, a week or so later. So I think, yeah, ultimately, they're just a, a more accessible and more useful guide for, for how to look at what's going on here. It's, 
the, the idea of a doubling rate, I think, is much more accessible than a 33% daily increase. Like, you know, everyone, sure, everyone knows what roughly a 33% increase means, but the idea of something doubling overnight is very dramatic. And I think, yeah, just again, with the purpose of this chart being to make this accessible to people who've not encountered data viz before, um, I really like what Lisa and Josh did there in terms of making this a very intuitive, um, yeah, an intuitive guide, essentially, yeah. And I mean, it gets to the point whereby when you start to see figures being published, you you do that mental calculation. Is that double? Is that a third? Is that a half? You know, it, it's something that does really help, I think, process the, the numbers on a day-to-day basis. Um, just a, a quick technical question, John. Um, those reference lines, would you call them exponential reference lines or linear reference lines? Because they look to the eye linear, but they're obviously plotting underneath the the shape uh, exponential numbers. Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, I mean, I think for all intents and purposes, they're linear in the sense that you know they appear linear on the page, and the concepts that the words that they each illustrate are linear concepts, like something mm. that doubles every day. Um, the the idea of something doing x every day is. I think it's it's a linear concept, even if the numbers involved are exponential. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, obviously, if this was a if this was on a linear y axis, then those charts would curve upwards, just like everything else. But yeah, I guess from that from that technical or linguistic perspective, I'd say in this case, I'd I'd call them linear. But yeah, um, and just a couple more things to touch on quickly: uh, the color choices. So obviously, there's a there's an FT style palette for colors. Um, What's the rationale for grouping, for example, um, South Korea, Japan in the sort of cyan colour, Spain, France? What's the what's the kind of thought of how you've allocated the colours in this case? Sure. So, and, and this is another thing where it's just fantastic working at the FT. So the, the colour palette we have, I think, is absolutely brilliant. And it's difficult to make a, a chart using our palette that looks boring. Um, so, and that's all credit for that. For that goes to Caroline Nevitt, who's our um, head of... UX and design on the on the data and visuals team, um, and so the 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 first version of this chart, I remember having a little a quick little chat with Alan Smith, our head of data visualization, um, uh, because and this was this was a version where um, if I just dig up the email, um, we had let's see, there were about a dozen countries that we had data for and wanted to bring out five or six to highlight. Um, and I'd say it was, I already, I already knew that we wanted to use, say, one colour, for example, for the countries that had succeeded in getting the virus under control. Um, because, you know, that just that, that felt thematically important. And the, the question there really was, do we, um, do we highlight all Asian countries in one colour, for example? Because obviously many of the countries that got it under control were Asian. Um, or do we differentiate between, for example, Hong Kong, Singapore, Japan, and then Korea, on the other hand, who at the time were still looking like one of the worst cases? So, And when I actually look back at the first chart we did, Korea was in a different colour to Hong Kong, Singapore, and Japan. Um, so, so yeah, and that's obviously evolved, you know, as, as it became clear that Korea had got this under control, I, I put it in the cyan as well. But the idea, yeah, was to use use the colours to group sort of semantic grouping in that example but then in other cases just to do sort of one colour per country and so it was just a case of picking from our colour palette to get maximum contrast between countries and and between any given country in the background greys um the other the more recent change i did was was putting france in blue along with spain um where france had previously been one of our greyed out sort of secondary countries and again the idea there is france is becoming more narratively editorially significant so it felt important to bring it out and it felt like it could sort of be semantically grouped with spain in the sense of being a western european like developed economy developed country having go, going through a similar similar um crisis so yeah it's, the whole thing has just been um ca- minimizing the number of distinct colors so that everyone can say the light blue ones the dark blue ones the pink ones that kind of thing um and uh and yeah co- varying between that semantic and geographic grouping and that the only other little sort of funny behind the scenes bit i would add is that when i added china because china wasn't initially in these charts because it was so off the scale at the beginning um i was thinking how can i come up with another country to use there and i thought i'd 
go through our palettes and see what we had hiding in the in the dark corners. And so for the China orange there is actually our colour for the Lib Dems. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was Fantastic. just a, a colour that had therefore been approved for use on our pink background, <laughs> but was sufficiently different to everything else to to work as another one. Yeah, what a nice, uh, what a nice sort of semantic marriage there. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> um, super stuff. I mean, the, the last question I had about the design um, before I go into sort of reflections on the overall process. Um, this is not an interactive piece. Um, I guess, in a sense, you are still chasing the progress of the story. But have you got um, ideas for making it interactive, or are you feeling that this now is is such a um, uh, a centerpiece that does work and operate as a static, um, that it should remain that way. It's it's a great question, and the the boring answer is that the the decisions around interactivity were mainly, um, were sort of you know quite pragmatic technical discussions. So at the very outset on the fourth of fourth of February when we started talking about this page before it existed at all there was a discussion about whether this should be a page that we built outside of the core FTCMS to be interactive, or whether it should be this page within our CMS that includes these dynamic images. And the, the considerations are, are things like, if we make an interactive page, obviously we can, there's, a lot, there's more flexibility over what we can do with it. But first of all, it's, we're asking our colleagues outside of our desk to do a lot more jumping through hoops there if they want to edit this piece, because the words that appear on this page would therefore, they would be in a, in a Google Doc belonging to our team. They wouldn't be in the CMS that everyone else is used to working with. Um, that's one consideration. But probably the bigger one is that for our readers, um, any of our readers who come to this in our mobile app would have to leave the app in order to, to view an interactive page that had been built outside our CMS. So they, they'd still see it. Um, they, there's, no, there's no issue about being able to see it, but you know, we risk then losing them from that journey in the app altogether. Um, you know, it just it's just not a not a great sort of user flow. Um, and given that we had these new dynamic image tools, which I talked about earlier, so that we can make these automatically updating maps that appear on this page, um, it felt like that was the way to go. So that's the reason there isn't interactivity. It wasn't a sort of editorial, or it wasn't a design decision. It was a reader and workflow and colleagues and, and that kind of thing decision um you know that all of the all of the stuff on this page including whether or not to have interactive versions of these things off the existing off this page that's all these are all ongoing conversations so you know we're not saying it never will be but it the question right now you know on um what are we on march uh march the 27th is um if we you know, if we were to make this interactive now, how much work would that require and what would it add that you can't already have? Now, before we had those small multiple charts, I think that there would have been a stronger case for, for adding an interactive right. version of this. But now that we can sort of say anyone can scroll down another few pixels and see where their country is, I think the case for an interactive version is is reduced. Similarly, um, now that this is outside the paywall, we know that anyone can can do that. Um, again, of course, interactivity brings with it all sorts of advantages. You know, people could just pick their own pairings of countries to compare them side by side. Um, but yeah, that really has been just a, a an organic um, decision making process. So at the outset, it was just about we had a static page already here and we wanted to put a chart into it. It wasn't necessarily Tr the known at the outset that I'd be updating these charts every day. So so it didn't feel like a huge undertaking um and of course with annotations we we can add a lot of information there that does away with the need for interactivity um so yeah i'd still say you know i am still getting dozens of emails every day from people saying what about my state or what about my country and that's the kind mm. of thing that interactivity could help with but um but yeah for now i think the the idea of a, a headline chart and then the find your own country in the small multiples kind of fulfills most of the the user needs that interactivity would provide so i think we'll probably stay as is but you know maybe by the time this comes out there'll be a nice shiny interactive version <laughs> yeah i mean that's i think that's really interesting the idea not just the part the pragmatics of how this all uh, the whole process works but also the the sense that that small multiples gives a almost like a release valve so that you can leave the the centerpiece chart as 
as an ever changing list of, of stories, but then this second container gives you that backup for serving those inevitable appetites that people have out there for seeing their country. Um and, and I think it's worth sort of wrapping up the, the conversation just about the 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 interactions that you do have because we've spoken about social media. Um and, and I, I know that for the FT and for yourself using social media not just to push this piece as a one off tweet but to accompany it with a bit of a descriptive thread and to sort of walk people through the steps. Um it's it's now become event tweeting. You know, people are queuing up. I remember a few days ago you posted a holding tweet saying coming soon guys and that in itself got more t- retweets and likes than than I've ever had <laughs> on any tweet. Um can you just sort of talk about the the role that you see social media for this kind of work having and obviously you've spoken about the the, the feedback that you've received which you've encouraged of course. Um there are some crazies out there who come out from their rocks occasionally and there are endless frustrating what about me this is great but have you thought about so how, how's that experience gone for you over the last few 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 days yeah or weeks? i mean it's been pretty surreal um i certainly you know when i made that chart i wasn't expecting it to take off like this and and it's been pretty crazy to see it see it get to where it has in that sense um but you know there's a, there's a lot of things here i think yeah i i just think you know for a critically important public health issue like this you want to reach as many people as possible and reach them where they are um now obviously that's reflected in our decision to put this outside the paywall as well so this isn't just a me um as an individual this is as an organization i think the ft we we appreciate that this is information that needs to go as wide to, to as many people as possible um, so just and, jumping, John, on, on that note, yeah. this could have been quite a lucrative thing. If we take, if, you know, if we take a dispassionate view, this could have been a, a commercially huge boost to the FT to, to keep it locked down. So obviously, there's been that cultural responsibility to know, no, this needs to go out there to reach people. Yeah, I, I mean, I'd say that it can work both ways because one one could still argue that by by putting this outside the paywall, we're bringing more people to our site who one day might might subscribe so it's not purely a sort of um charitable offering but 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 yeah the thinking was very much look people need to see this and it's a you know it's a page that we're going to have on our site indefinitely um and you know it's it's an, it's a critically important issue why why should we keep it behind the paywall especially once our peers at other organizations had started putting their coronavirus content um free to read so 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 yeah, I I think you know we did do that for good reasons, but they're also it doesn't it doesn't sort of we don't necessarily take as big a hit on something like this I think as people might think. Um, but yeah, it was just a case of for me of of um getting this out to as many people as possible, and it's been very clear like you know people all over the world, um and of all demographics and and I get messages from friends saying that like their mum or their gran is just shared this chart with them and so it's clearly getting data visualization as a concept as well as of course the subject matter um out to people who've never encountered charts before which i think is fantastic um uh, but yeah the other thing i'd say and i've always said this about sharing graphics on social media is the the feedback that one gets is is absolutely invaluable i mean it's hard to do um user research in data visualization we have academics who spend their whole careers doing that and of course i'm not I'm not saying that the responses to tweets and emails and things are academic grade. You know, I don't, mm-hmm. I haven't controlled for for demographics and that kind of stuff. But I can now sit here and look at literally hundreds, probably over, I, in fact, yeah, probably several thousand now, Twitter replies and emails about these charts, and that's a vast trove, and and comments on the FT website as well. Um, it's a huge resource of of how people are consuming these did they like them did they not like them what were their views on the axes what are their views on the colors um what are their views on font sizes um you know all of all of this kind of stuff and again the I comments mean, that could on be our a website, huge research yeah data set in itself absolutely yeah and i was thinking i mean I'd, I'd certainly i don't know what the rules are about sharing emails sent to my FT email address but i'd be more than happy to to put all of that out there because it's there's fascinating stuff. Um, and again, a lot of the comments on our website are people explicitly saying, um, these charts are fantastic. We want to see more of this. Here's why I pay for the FT, that kind of stuff. I got one email from someone saying that 
thanks to the charts they'd seen on Twitter, they'd just subscribed to the FT. Um, so, you know, it's been for our team at the FT, this has been an enormous sort of political win. Um, you know, I know this story is much, this story, this issue is much bigger than that, but it, we can now point very clearly to this and say the financial, a key value proposition that the Financial Times offers to its readers and to non-subscribers but potential subscribers is the data visualization that we do so so yeah i think by putting this out as as much as i have done on social media it's really just hugely you know increased the exposure of people to this to the work that our team does um and i think that can really only be a good thing so yeah it's been it's been pretty wild at times i've had to turn off notifications on all sorts of platforms <laughs> Um, and I made my request the other day that people email instead of DMing. So it's been a, a constant learning curve in terms of the sort of engagement side of it. But but yeah, I think on, only a good thing, only a valuable thing. Absolutely. And, you know, it's from the outside, it's been, um, again, with the same caveat, horrible story to, to have to cover. Um, but it's been fantastic to see the 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 presence of this in in so many people's consciousness every day people are uh, you know discovering it learning from it and you know alongside some of the other newsrooms out there are doing some great stuff it's uh, it's put DataViz in a wonderful light at a time when uh, it's been most needed so I think you know we'll we'll look back on this period in a few years time um, with you know lots of lots of regrets but. I think we'll look at this as a as a real turning point to the the visibility, the awareness, and just the the presence of the role of this uh, this this field yeah. in our in our lives. So yeah. wonderful, John. I, I'm very aware that I'm eating into your valuable time. You've probably got lots of things to get on with. Thank you ever so much for sharing your insights in this work. Um, thank you everyone out there for tuning in. See you next time on Explore Explain. To see more information about today's episode including links to the key sites and resources mentioned, visit my website at visualizingdata.com. You'll also find details about my book, information about my public and private training courses, as well as over a decade of blog posts. If you've enjoyed this series, please consider liking, subscribing and spreading the word. See you next time. Explore Explain is a Matt Notes interactive production.